Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Brittany Boston, and I will be the monitor for today's discussion. Um, before we get into anything, I do want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Just so you know, as participants, you are in listen only mode. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put those in the questions or chat box. Um, we will answer any questions or comments at the end of the presentation. And you can also raise your hand and if you have a working microphone, ask questions that way as well. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view at a later date. Um, so our presenter today is Kirsten Sherry from ICSPS as well. And she will be sharing some tips and tricks and some information on email etiquette as we are finding ourselves in an all virtual world currently. So with that, I will hand the reins over to Kirsten. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you everyone for um, joining us today. Normally my picture would be right here. I'm not sure what happened with that. Um, but my name is Kirsten Cherry with ICSPS and I am an online marketing coordinator for our center. Um, so today we just really wanted to focus on email etiquette as well as some tips and tricks for how to best manage your email um, during this virtual time that we're all living in a virtual world. Um, our email is our main streamline of communication now more than ever. So that's what we're going to be speaking about today. Um, before we get started, um, for every We Have a Wednesday webinar, we do a couple of beginning polls. So I'm going to go ahead and start that polling. It should be live and interactive where you can click it. Um, and so first, we just want to know where is your local area? So if you could select one of the following, we do apologize for the limited um amount of selections if you want to be more specific with your location you can type that in the chat box we always like to know um, where our constituents are joining us from today so i'll give everyone a couple more seconds to answer this poll okay i'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the result so we have quite a few of you joining us from Chicago today, which is great. Um, and then a pretty equal amount from Northern Central and Southern Illinois, which is also always good to have um, everyone from around the state joining us. Don't mind my dog picture there. <laughs> um, and then our next poll is we wanna know which partner do you represent? best. So we're going to go ahead and launch that poll. And we'll give everyone a couple seconds for that. Again, we apologize for the limited amount of selections. But if you are um, want to be more specific, feel free to type that in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll as well and share our results. So we have a huge chunk of us joining from Title One today. Um, welcome all of you and quite a few of you from other WIOA partners and stakeholders as well. So again, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we really do appreciate it and we hope that you find um, this content valuable today. Um, so we're not quite done with the polls yet. I'm going to do just a couple of beginning polls to start us off. Um, so have you ever had a bad experience with a work email chain? So any bad experience with a work email chain? Um, this could be, you know, there was miscommunication. This could be um, just you lost the email because the chain was so long. Um, whatever the situation is. So just a quick quick poll here. Won't give everyone too long to answer yes or no. Okay. 
I went ahead and closed that poll and then tried to share the results here. Not really working for me, but 76% of you said yes. And then 24% um, of you said no. So to that 24%, um, you are lucky. I would say that. And then the next poll, I just want to know, um, we'll give everyone a little bit longer to answer this, is what common email mistakes cause you the most irritation? So just common um, things that we notice in our emails, may or may not notice. Um, so which one of these irritates you the most? Um, I should have put an option in there if there's not something that really irritates you or gets under your skin, but I feel like for most of us there is. So we'll give everyone a couple seconds to answer this poll as well. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results again. There we go, it worked that time. So spelling and grammar, 50% of you say that is the thing that irritates you the most. Um, which is crazy, but as email is becoming more and more prevalent as our main streamline of communication, and we're so used to doing other things like texting, where spelling and grammar isn't as um, prevalent, it makes sense that we would be more relaxed on spelling and grammar, grammar in our emails as well. Um, and then 30% of you say extended subject lines and no message. 6% um, of you don't really mind or 6% do mind if you use your first name, which means a lot of you don't mind if someone uses your first name, um, even if they're a stranger to you. And then 14% capital letters and exclamation points um, irritate you the most. So we will, that's just some good information for us to get started today and kind of keep in mind in the back of our, back of our heads as we get started. Um, so the first thing I want to go over is just some tips for effective email communication. Some of these are pretty, um, self-explanatory, we already know them, but it's always good to reiterate them and take that time to think about them and think to yourself, you know, am I really implementing these things in my emails? Um, because emails becoming so second nature to us, right? So the first one is to include a clear direct subject line. So for those of you who did not like those long subject lines, um, making sure that you're not one of those people who are doing that um, and you know, maybe sharing these slides later on with some people in your office, maybe they'll kind of, you know, get the hint that you need a clear, direct subject line. Um, some good examples of this would be meeting date changed, a uh, quick question about your presentation, or suggestions for the proposal. Um, so just a quick line, it doesn't need to be a full sentence or anything like that. Um, the second email adequate rule is to be polite. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory with it, within itself. And we'll move on to the third one, which is to think twice before hitting the reply all button. So no one wants to read emails from 20 different people that have nothing to do with them. Um, and ignoring emails can be difficult whenever you're really trying to get something done and you're trying to focus, especially now that we're all working from home and we have, not only do we have, you know, things that would distract us if we were in an office setting, but now we have things at home that would distract us, you know, dirty dishes, children, pets, um, we have our smartphones going off. So those distracting pop-up messages whenever an email chain is going on and you're just CC'd on it, um, that could be really distracting whenever you're trying to focus on a project. So if you are someone who quite frequently hits the reply all button, you might wanna just think about who your audience is and who's receiving that message. Um, and it might be better or more beneficial to not CC them and then just do a follow-up email with them alone, kind of summarizing and explaining the information that they need to know in that message for a need to know basis. It might be a little bit more work for you, um, but especially someone like when I'm emailing my boss, I know that her, her email is getting flooded, um, especially now more than ever. So sometimes it's easier for me to not CC her on things and then just email her really quickly. Um, and then number four, 
four, include a signature block on all of your emails. Um, I think most of us in the professional world do do this, but sometimes we slack when we're emailing, you know, within our office, maybe we don't always include an email block. So just making sure you're doing that. Um, your email block is a reflection of yourself professionally. I um, mean, it's kind of like, you know, I would say it's synonymous to like a good handshake. I know we're not really shaking hands right now, um, especially because we're all behind a computer as well. So making sure you have that signature block just shows good professionalism. Um, I know, for example, our office, we all have a cohesive signature block. So that way, when we're emailing constituents outside of our center, um, they know, you know, we are ICSPS and anyone that has that signature is from our center and is representing our center. Um, so it's just good for professionalism for your office to keep that cohesive um, and it provides your reader with information about you um, which obviously is relevant as well um, number five use professional salutations so i think this can be more common whenever we're speaking with our coworkers. Um, you know saying things like hey you guys or like um, i know something that i'm really guilty of is we, I say like, hi ladies in our office. Um, when I'm sending an email to multiple people in our office, um, we have quite a few women that work in our office. Um, so all, I'm guilty of doing that. But this relaxed nature of our writings, um, it does affect your lack of professionalism and it, it is a reflection on yourself. So refraining from using things like, hey, um, or I've never seen anyone use yo, but that's the article that I received these tips from, use that as an example. Um, but just refraining from that relaxed nature and keeping it simple, you know, hi, hello. I always use the time of day, like good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, things like that. Um, number six, use exclamation points um, and all caps sparingly. So you wanna try to refrain from showing um, excess emotion uh, unless it's it's warranted um, so if you do choose to use an exclamation point use it sparingly some people get carried away with this um, and they put a number of exclamation points and it can be perceived as too emotional or immature or it might be perceived as angry whenever you're just trying to perceive yourself as excited or something else so it can be a huge um, contributor to miscommunication so you want to try to refrain from that. And then number seven is to be cautious with humor. I know that we are missing that one-on-one -on -one face interaction. Me and Brittany were just talking about that right before this webinar. And it's it's easy to want to use humor in your emails, especially when you're emailing coworkers, because you know you're missing that aspect of your work life right now, um, that social social aspect. Um, but humor can sometimes get lost in translation, especially as everyone's busy. So we're missing the right tone and the facial expressions in that professional exchange. Um, so it's really just better to leave humor out of emails unless you know the recipient really, really well. Um, I do know that we do use humor in our emails between each other in our center, but we have been around each other enough to know each other's personalities. Um, so just you know, knowing who your audience is is a big part of that one. Um, number eight, know that people from different cultures speak and write differently, um, especially being a state entity. We are working with people all across the state from all different backgrounds, um, coming from all different areas, um, and miscommunication can easily occur, especially when written, um, and we can't see that person's body language, and we can't read their lips, we can't see their facial expressions, things like that. So just making sure that if you are emailing someone that you are you've never met before um, is a stranger to you to be aware that they potentially could be from a different cultural background and speak and write differently. Um, so just having that in the back of your mind and thinking about that when you're sending those emails. Um, number nine, reply to your emails even if the email wasn't intended to you because. I am guilty of this. I have sent, you know, the wrong email to so and so, and it was supposed to go to a different person. So even if that email wasn't intended to you, respond back to that person. Let them know um, that they made a mistake and that they need to correct it. And then also replying to all of your emails, especially nowadays when things are getting flooded, can be so time-consuming and taxing on us. Um, but 
you are sending a message when you don't reply and you are sending a message when you do reply. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, I know that this is difficult, but a reply isn't necessary a reply isn't always necessary, but sometimes it just serves as good email etiquette, even if you're just saying like, thank you, I'll, I'll get to that, um, short things like that. And, um, or even if you just say like, I know you're very busy, but I don't think you meant to send this email to me and I want to let you know so you could send it to the correct person, um, just sending an email like that. But that lack of reply or the amount of time you take to reply or um, you replying, and that sends a message as well to your receiver. So keeping that in mind. And then number 10, um, to proofread every message. I know that this is time consuming again, but your mistakes won't go unnoticed by your recipients. 50% of you said that spelling and grammar was the most irritating thing for you when you're reading an email, if you notice spelling and grammar issues. So proofreading that, um, a really good tool that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but something that I use is Grammarly. Um, it's a website that you can actually incorporate into your internet browser, and it it's kind of like um, a spelling and grammar check on Word. So if you're not familiar with it, it's called Grammarly, and it will be on the resources page that we um, incorporate with these slides whenever we put them up on our website. But it, it is a free um software that you can install it goes right into your browser and then anytime you're typing something it's editing it for you um, i do find that sometimes it is wrong and you do have to double check yourself but it's good because it highlights things and it makes you stop and think and you might have to google you know is that spelling right is that hyphenated correctly um, but it it does kind of catch you in a lot of things and it's definitely helped me um, throughout my career and in school and in this, this center. Okay, number 11, um, add the email address last. This is such a hard habit to break. Um, we are so used to adding the email address first. And this is something that I've started to try to implement um, in my emailing habits as well. Um, and this is just solely because you don't wanna accidentally send an email before you finish writing it, before you finish proving it. Um, maybe you accidentally typed the wrong email address and you need to double check that. Um, even when you're just replying to a message, it's always best practice to delete that recipient's address and then insert it at the very end when you know it's ready to be sent. Um, this is definitely going to be a hard habit to break, but it might be something you want to start implementing, um, especially if you are a person who has accidentally sent an email. I know um, I've accidentally sent blank emails before because I was going to copy and paste something in and I already put the address in there and I accidentally hit send. So um, just good things to, if you start cognitively thinking of them and implementing them, they will just become second nature to you. Um, and then number 12, double check that you've selected the correct recipient. That kind of goes along with number 11. Um, but when you're typing a name from your address book on the email line, it's easy, it's easy to select the wrong name, which can be embarrassing to you and to the person who receives the email by mistake. Um, number 13, keep your fonts classic. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. I just always use the um, normal font that my email allows me to have. Um, I don't really mess with it that much. Usually it's pretty simple black font or black color, Times New Roman, Arial, things like that. Um, the cardinal rule, obviously, your email should be easy for other people to read. I know sometimes when I'm trying to highlight a point or two, I might um, underline it or bold it or highlight it in yellow or make it blue. Um, so those are things that you can implement at your discretion. But generally, you just want to keep it pretty simple. Um, and then number 14, keep tabs on your tone and show respect and restraint. So we'll talk about tone a little bit later. Um, but just being respectful in your emails, I, I think that's, you know, kind of goes without saying. Um, and just, just as jokes get lost in translation, tone is easy to misconstrue without the context um, you would normally get from vocal cues and facial expressions. So it's easy to come off as more abrupt than you might have intended. And you meant to just be straightforward and they might read that as angry or curt suit. So to just avoid misunderstandings, we would recommend that you just read your message out loud before hitting send. And if it sounds harsh to you, it will sound harsh to the reader. Um, so that's kind of just another little tip. Um, and then number 15, just remember that nothing is confidential. You know, we're working in 
the the state realm and these state these state fields and partners. Um, so nothing is confidential and always remember um, to write so accordingly. So our next slides are just some quick tips for effective email communication. Um, just practice being clear and concise with your message. I find that bullet points usually help me out a lot with this. You don't wanna be writing novels. Um, no one has time to read that. And most of the time they will skim it and then they will miss important information. Um, bullet, um, the next bullet point before sending, always reread your message and double check for your grammar and misused words. Again, we touched on that. You can see, even if you don't think it's a big deal, 50% of you think it's a big deal. So that is a huge chunk um, of your field that is noticing you when you don't capitalize something correctly or you spell something wrong. And so just being cognitive of that because it is a reflection on you as a professional. And then copy back salient points from replying to an earlier message. This is something that really helps me. Um, and I know that it helps my coworkers as well. Just clarifying things, reiterating what they just sent to you um, and copying those salient points even when you're just responding to the message to make sure that you are understanding that communication correctly. Um, and then realize that once your message is sent, it's difficult to recall that message. So that's why some of those best practices of, you know, not typing in the address until you've had a chance to read over the message and you've had a chance to um, proofread it and all those things can come into play there. So that way you are 100% or at least 99.5% sure that you want to send that email um, and that it won't reflect badly on you later in any way. And then practice the 24 hour rule when you're upset, whether we know it or not, um, our emotions and feelings can come out into our emails. And we will talk about that a little bit later, but practicing the 24 hour rule when you're upset and you might not even be upset about something with work, and you get a work email and you feel obligated to reply to it right away, you know, maybe taking that time to just go on a walk, taking that time to go, um, you know, pet with pet your pet or pet your dog a little bit or go get a drink, refresh in your coffee, um, just step away if something has made you upset and then come back to that email later. Um, it doesn't always necessarily have to be 24 hours, but um, for some things in our lives, we might need 24 hours to cool down from it. Um, and then the next point, avoid shortcuts and abbreviations in business email messages. That kind of goes along with spelling and grammar. But as our world is becoming more and more technology dependent, and we are more and more dependent on our phones, um, we're constantly, I know for me, like I get my emails right on my phone. So I almost open my emails like a text message, and it's so easy to reply to it as a text message and not use um, proper email etiquette. So just being cognitive of that, even if you're emailing someone back on your phone, don't use those shortcuts and abbreviations. And then the next point we're gonna go over is some more tips. Um, only discuss public matters. Um, briefly introduce yourself. I always make this the best practice. I actually started this position two weeks before um, COVID-19 and the pandemic and quarantine and all of the things that we've all been dealing with hit this year. So I have been working with and emailing and meeting people only virtually. I've never met them in person before. So briefly introducing yourself and just, you know, what partner you're with, what your title is, um, kind of helps bridge that gap that we're experiencing right now because we can't shake people's hands and we can't meet them in person and, you know, make eye contact and all those good things. Um, use exclamation points sparingly. We've kind of just discussed that a little bit. Be careful with confidential information. This is kind of, you know, um, self-explanatory. Respond in a timely fashion. Again, we're going to talk about that a little later and focus more on that point. But your ability to respond in a timely fashion, whether you do or you don't, that sends a message within itself. Um, refrain from sending one-liners. Um, a huge portion of you um, did not like that. And that was one of the things that irritated you the most. Um, keeping your content clean, being clear in your subject line. Um, your subject line can determine whether you get mistaken for spam or not, especially if you are emailing someone that's working with a state email, a government email. Um, their email is being filtrated even more than ours is. Um, it's being filtrated. And so 
refraining from sending those one liner liners and being clear in your subject line can help you not go into their spam folder. Um, and then provide a warning when you're sending large attachments. I always like this. I send a lot of large attachments and I have some tips for that um, and how to do that not through your email. Um, but providing a warning maybe in the subject line, you know, this has five large attachments to it. Um, only copy others on a need to know basis. We kind of talked about that when we discussed the reply all um, portion of it. And then don't be afraid to pick up your phone. So if your content or your message, it's just sometimes it's just easier to call people. Um, I know that I feel like that a lot because, you know, I need clarification on this, this, and this. And sometimes it's just too time consuming or I don't have the time to write it all in email. So it's easier if I just do a quick five minute phone call. Uh, I know our office does that a lot. And don't be afraid to pick up the phone. Don't be afraid to maybe shoot someone a quick email and say, hey, do you have time today for a 15 minute phone call? I need clarification on this point. And honestly, it's just way too much for me to email. Um, so don't be afraid to do that in your offices and keep that open door policy, despite the fact that we are not in our offices right now. Um, and then always include a signature and a signature block. We discussed that and how it reflects on your professionalism and then know your audience as well for things like humor and all that. So now we're going to move on to um, tricks for email etiquette. And I wanted to do some quick polls to kind of start us off with this as well. Um, so the first one is, do you ever feel like you could better organize your email, like organize your inbox and things like that? Um, that's probably something that we don't really spend a lot of time on. Um, who has time to go through and organize your inbox? You're barely just trying to keep up with opening your emails, right? So if you feel like you could better organize your email, and this might help you be more productive, this is something that we're going to talk about, some tricks for that. Um, so we already had everyone vote. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and share those results. So 93% of you said yes, that you do feel like that, which I assumed, but didn't, didn't want to um, get too crazy with that. And then we're going to do one more poll, which is, have you ever accidentally bypassed an email or forgotten to follow up with an email, um, forgotten that you had a project that you needed to do? Um, because the email got lost or what have you. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. Okay, we'll give everyone a couple seconds to answer this as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and share the results. It looks like it's about to pop up. 91% of you said yes and 9% said no. So to that 9%, you are a lot more organized than um, most working people and you are on top of your email, which I commend you for. Um, I can't say that I can join you in that though. Um, I know we all could work on that. Um, and I know that sometimes, especially when you're joining a new job like me and you're still trying to you know, learn the ropes and catch on to who is who and all those things, it can be easy to lose things in translation um, and lose things in your email whenever you're still trying to just learn how to even work your email and work things like that, especially if you're a new employee or fairly new employee and then you got hit with this with this pandemic like I did. Um, okay, so we're going to do go over some tricks for how to, you know, manage your email communication, manage your inbox. Um, so that way you can be more effective in your email communication and in your email etiquette um, so that you're not losing emails. Because remember, when you don't reply or you forget to reply or what have you, that is sending a message as well. And so a good principle to follow is the Ohio principle, which stands for only handle it once. So things that you need to do when you first open a new email, decide immediately what action you should take. And those actions can be divided into three categories. You either read it straight away, respond or forward it or file it, whatever you need to do. You read it to the point where you determine that it requires action later and you can send it to your to do list. Um, and we'll talk about how you can actually do this on Outlook or, you know, maybe you have a, a handwritten to do list that you like to do those things on. I personally do both um, because you can never be too organized. And then the third one is label as one that's not worth reading and you just delete it. I know our center, we have a center email and sometimes we get emails that are just really directed towards one person and they're not directed towards me. I know that that 
that is not my directive to take care of that that email and so it's easy for me to just open it determine who it's best going to go to and i know that that person is going to reply because we all get those those emails from our center email and then um i just label it as one that's not really worth reading or i do read it and then i just delete it so some tips for organizing your email and this might be some things that you know you are aware of and you don't really use um, or you are not aware of but this little button right here the read and unread button um i use this quite frequently because sometimes especially because i get my emails right on my phone i will open an email like a text message and i will determine that it does need further action but i'm on my phone i'm out to eat you know it's after work hours whatever or I, i'm at the grocery store or i'm in my car um, and I accidentally opened that email. And so clicking this read unread button helps me because it makes the message un unread again in my inbox. And so I know to go back to it. Um, and so this can be beneficial even if you're just working and you know your little email notification pops up on the side of your Word document that you're working on and you accidentally click it and then you're like, shoot, I need to address this later. So you can click that unread button and it will make it blue again in your Outlook. So that way, you know, you need to go back to it. Um, and that way it, it kind of makes it go from opened to unopened. Um, so that's just a quick way that you can use that tool. And then also the follow-up um, flag. So if you select this, if you want your email to become red flagged because you need to respond or you need to follow up with that person after. Um, I know sometimes, especially for me, I get lost in which presenter is presenting which Wednesday and I have to double check myself. So I use this flag to kind of follow up with them. Um, once I get, once I initially email them, letting them know, you know, you're the presenter for this date, I can set a follow up reminder um, for a certain calendar date. And that way I know to follow up with them um, prior to their Wednesday that they are presenting. Um, so just another organization tool. And then if you do find yourself, you know, we're all at home, we're all on at home internet. Um, Brittany was just talking about how typically when we have webinars, she has been trying to go into the office. No one else is in our office right now. Um, but because her at home internet can be kind of faulty sometimes. So if you find yourself not receiving new emails um, and you're expecting to get them, just clicking that send and receive button, it's kind of like a refresh for your browser. Okay, um, and then some other tricks for managing your email communication is that um, I did have these circled, but it didn't pop up for us, but this focused inbox over to your left, clicking that focus inbox, you can actually organize your email based on what you wanna focus on, and then the rest of your emails will go into an other folder. Um, and so that your Outlook actually determines that by the people that you email quite often and it's almost like siri kind of your outlook is um organizing your email trends and watching your email trends kind of like a big brother and the outlook if you turn on this focused inbox it will only infiltrate emails into your focused folder which are that's when you're going to get notifications on the side and things like that if you um are emailing that person quite frequently, or you can even, you know, categorize it and do like, if this email folk um, has this subject line or has this word in this subject line, you do want it to come through. And then you can kind of send all your other emails to the other folder for the day. So I use this whenever I'm trying to focus on a big project and I don't want to be distracted um, by little things that I know aren't going to take me very long to do. And I can just do it at the end of my work day or at the beginning of the next work day. And so this helps me do that by turning on that focused inbox. And then I'll only usually let emails come in that are from um, my boss or from, you know, maybe one or two other people that I know that they're working on something pressing they might need my help with for that day. Um, and that's things that are like time sensitive. Um, so you can kind of organize your email that way. Um, the next thing you can do is this new folder button over in the second image you can actually organize your email into folders just like you would on your desktop so if you have a chain of emails that have to do with a big project that you're getting multiple directives from from multiple people 
you can send all of those emails for that one project into a folder and then label that. So that way you're not searching your email, trying to find it. Um, I know that this happens to me often because I'm getting a lot thrown at me right now because I'm going to be on a ton of different projects with a ton of different partners. Um, my position is kind of all encompassing at our center. And so sometimes I get, um, I get a directive and I can't work on that directive for two weeks because I'm trying to finish my last directive. And so helping that this, these folders help me so I can organize those, that chain of email and I don't have to try to go back and try to find them or even accidentally delete them or anything because they just automatically go in this folder. And then I know all the email communication that I need to go over again and kind of refresh my memory is in that folder and you can label them as well. Um, so that's just another little trick. And then over here in the third image, if you click conversations, that conversations button, you can actually organize your e inbox by um, all these different options. You can organize it by conversations if you just want to focus on certain people um, and things like that. And then this next slide, um, the uh, I want to focus on this link first, um, how to tame your inbox. This kind of goes with the previous slide. So this YouTube video will be on the reference sheet um, that we will put on our website to go along with these PowerPoint slides um, after the presentation today. But this YouTube video is amazing. Um, it's a training video on Outlook everything you could possibly ever want to know about Outlook. Outlook calendars, Outlook email, um, and all the organizational tools. And it shows you how to create templates for blocks of content for meetings or for group projects, et cetera, which that is a huge time saver. Um, and with everything being streamlined through our email now, you know, we can't just pop over and ask our boss, boss a quick question or pop over and say, you know, hey, do you, could we meet later? Um, could we go to lunch together and have a work working lunch meeting? You can't do that anymore. So having a template um, for for meetings for yourself, that way you can just um, push it really quickly, could definitely be a time saver and beneficial, um, or for group projects and things like that. Um, you can even he even teaches you in the training how to play sounds, play specific sounds um for specific emails and you can organize that by subject line you can organize that by sender um so if you want to do a little bell sound for you know emails from your boss to let yourself know that you need to give that um, direct attention or things like that you can organize your inbox like that um, he teaches you how to create a task list a to-do list um, color code them, etc. And some of you might be aware of some of these things already, um, but the training itself is like 30 minutes. So if you watch the whole thing, um, I learned so much. It was crazy. And I feel like I'm, I mean, I'm the technology um, marketing coordinator for our office. So I feel like I'm pretty tech savvy, but I even, you know, had some things that I wasn't aware of for Outlook. So it's definitely beneficial. Definitely check out that video. Um, and then some things that our office has been using for if you're trying to upload big file sizes, you know, we're not right next to each other anymore in the cubicles. So you can't just print something off and show it to them um, or just bring over your laptop and show it to them. So if you do need to send a big file, um, here is some some tricks for some softwares that our office has been using. Um, so some of you are probably really familiar oops, with Dropbox. Um, Dropbox does have a 30 day free trial. So there was just one file that was way too big that I had to send. And so I just signed up for a quick 30 day free trial and canceled it um, so that I wouldn't get charged just so I could send that one file. Um, you could do things like mock form. I know our center has a mock form that we can um, send a link to people who need to email us big files and they can upload it that way. Um, you can always try Google Docs. Sometimes Google Docs, um, the file is even too big for, for that. But sometimes um, if it's just a little too big for your email, for the file size, you can upload it to Google Docs and then share it. And then they can download that file onto their desktop. Um, and you can also use shrinking softwares um, and shrinking websites that will shrink your files. So something that I do on the daily is shrink our PDFs. Um, everything that you see on our website is things that I'm putting up on there and they're all PDFs. And so I'm having to shrink that file size so that way I can upload it to our website. Um, 
So I use that website shrinkpdf.com a lot. Um, if you need to compress a picture, a PNG or a JPEG, honestly, if you just Google um, compress, you know, Word document, compress, Excel file, whatever, these websites will come up where they're just very straightforward. It's compresspng.com or compress um, jpeg.com and that's the ones you want and it's super easy to use you just upload drag your file over to um, the upload box and then it will shrink it for you and it shows you the percentage that's shrinking it to as well in case you need a specific file size so we're going to move on to tone which is what i really want to focus on today um, i think i'm going to skip these polls just for time's sake but just something to think about, it, have you ever discovered that your coworker misinterpreted your intention of an email before? So just, you know, kind of reflect on that a little bit. And then have you ever misinterpreted a coworker or a boss's intention of an email before? I think we could probably all say that we, we have, you know, um, at some point in our careers. So tone is the biggest side effect um, for miscommunication, especially in text-based communication. Um, a study that I've read estimates that about $37 billion is lost yearly due to communication barriers, employee misunderstandings, and miscommunication. So this is a big issue um, for, our, for our entities and our partners. Um, and then a study from UCLA found that the impact of communication is determined 38% by voice, quality, 55% by nonverbal, and a mere 7% by the words used. So that means that our brains are only interpreting and having impactful communication by 7% whenever we're just reading the text in our emails. So as we increasingly communicate more during for chat, um, text messages, and email messaging, it's only natural that misunderstand, more misunderstandings are going to occur. So how do we, you know, um, combat those misunderstandings? I think the best way to combat that, those misunderstandings is understanding that they are going to happen um, and giving people, you know, the benefit of the doubt. So five reasons why email, text, and chat um, can be barriers of communication. If we understand these things, we can help to be more aware of them, make our coworkers more aware of them, um, and, and lead with more empathy in our offices. Um, so number one, the number one reason why email, text, and chat um, communication can be barriers of communication is that we're missing that context. Um, we have no idea if the sender of that email is at home with kids yelling, if they're working on a Sunday night when they're supposed to be having dinner with their family. Um, is that person suffering from a cold? Um, is that person quarantining right now? A lot of people are having to do that and they have been stuck in their house for two weeks and can't, can't leave, going a little stir crazy. Um, is, are they in a noisy office space or um, are they traveling? Are they having to travel for work um, right now in an airport? Um, are they having trouble concentrating on the message that they're writing? It's a lot harder to put ourselves in other people's shoes when we can't see those shoes. We can't see the context. Um, so that's the number one thing. And then number two is missing body language. Um, no facial expressions, no tone of voice, no posture or other nonverbal communication. The most classic statistic referred to comes from UCLA um, professor in the 1960s and he states that 93% of all communication is nonverbal, which means again that when we're reading an email, we are only having impactful communication of 7%. And the other 93% we are missing. So to bridge that gap, I truly believe that we have to understand that it is a gap and understand why it's a gap and do everything in our power um, to use those, those text-based mediums like email to make sure that we are um, trying to bridge that gap. Um, number three, the third reason is we're miss missing emotional content, and that's where you will see people trying to implement those exclamation points, um, trying to use emoticons and thing like, things like that to make up for that emotional content that we're missing. Um, so the lack of emotional cues can create huge odds of communication barriers and face to face with someone while talking you get a feel for how they are interpreting your words. So if you've ever been having a conversation with someone and you ask them a question they are communicating without using verbal communication right away because you can read their body language, you can read their facial expressions, and you, you might even add more to the conversation verbally before they do because you're reading their reaction to it. Um, and you will eventually 
you will eventually learn someone's emotional preferences in text-based communication mediums, but it happens much slower and there's a lot more trial and error. And in a fast paced working world, we just really do not have the time for that. Um, so it's important to be, be aware of these things and try to mitigate them as much as, as, much as possible. Um, and then emotional content is the fine line between interpreting a curt message or someone who's busy and trying to get a lot of things done that day as angry instead of that person just simply writing it. They might just be writing it in a hurry because they're trying to get a lot of things done that day. And so those things are the things that are getting lost in translation and not having impactful communication when we're emailing. Um, and then a lot of people try to make up for this by using emoticons. I know we use that a lot in our office um, and those are fine, they're fun, um, but they don't effectively replace emotions in a text-based communication. And I think the longer we're at home right now, the more we're probably feeling that, um, that lack of the emotion in our communications. And then number four, it's easier to argue or interpret something negative. So um, the, it's easier to confront someone whose face you can't see. We all know that. Uh, it's not a new thing. And it's easier to interpret something negatively. I don't know why, but it is in human nature that we always interpret things um, more negative than we do positive. Um, and be, I think the only real way to combat this is to be emotionally aware and emotionally mature. And, you know, you might read something and if there were already unresolved emotions or past negative events with that working person or with that coworker, you might read something as super negative. Um, but just stopping yourself and thinking for a second, like, OK, was that really their intent? Maybe I need to clarify that. Um, and then number five, delay triggered misunderstandings. So this delays the delayed response um, can wreak havoc on our understanding and create communication barriers if you don't answer back when that person is expecting you to or as quickly um, as they want you to if you're not responding again we discussed this before you are sending a message and they might begin to wonder why you're not responding are you mad at them um you know is their project not a priority to you that you're taking two weeks to respond to their message um, and they start to tell themselves a story that you're ignoring them or you're mad at them um, and let's be honest sometimes we are ignoring messages because we are a little you know peeved off and you need that 24-hour rule to kind of calm down which is fine but if you're taking two weeks to respond to someone's email you are sending them a message um, that you know that you don't value them or you don't value their work so just being cognitive of that as well um, so a good example of this is that if you look at a typical email address, you can almost always interpret things like this. So if you, if your boss gives you a directive, um, you might email them back and say, okay, I will see if I can manage to get that done today. And what you actually, what was heard from your boss is that I already have loads of work, but because you're obnoxious and you're my boss and you're piling in more, I guess I will do it because I have no choice. Like, what am I supposed to do? You're my boss. I can't, I can't tell you no. Um, and so what you could have written instead of, okay, I will see if I can manage that. You could have written, I will get to it as soon as I'm done with this other stuff on my schedule um, or these other projects and kind of lay them out you know, communicating what you already have on your plate and then saying it might take me some time to get to that project. Is this urgent? Does this need my direct attention? Um, and a best practice as the sender as well is maybe in the subject line or in the message you put this is due by, you know, X date or this needs your direct attention. I need this by this date. Um, so just being clear in your in your messaging as well. Um, and then keeping in mind that the medium is a message, we've discussed this. Um, so email, using email is a message within itself um, without even any text. Um, and if the conversation is lengthy, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call. Um, don't leave people hanging. Don't just not respond. Um, a lot of people do this and it can be unclear if you've received that message if you do this. Um, always give people the benefit of the doubt I know that this is sometimes hard to do, but we need to use empathy always and we need to lead with empathy even more now than ever because we really don't know what our coworkers are dealing with. Um, and 
sorry, I apologize. Um, we really don't know what our coworkers are dealing with. We don't know what their home situation is. Um, we don't know what their working situation is and other stressors. People are having to, you know, cancel life events, cancel birthday parties, cancel weddings, um, cancel family events, um, stay home when they really don't want to. And it is taking a toll on people's mental health. And we need to be cognitive of that. We need to be aware of that. Um, and so just giving people the benefit of the doubt checking in with them, giving them a phone call instead of sending them that email, using empathy always. Um, I don't know why, but we always, as human beings, we always interpret things more negatively. And so a scholar, Kristen Byron, believes that misinterpretation comes in two different forms. We either try to downplay positive texts, positive emails, um, and make them more neutral, or we automatically interpret them negatively. And we tend to dampen those positive messages to make them more neutral because we it's human nature that we want to assume the worst in questionable messages to make them more negative because we're trying to make up for that context because we're lacking it because we're not in person. Um, so just recognizing that we are on in unprecedented times. I know we're all so sick of hearing that um, and recognize that people are dealing with mental health. They're dealing with kids, canceled vacations. Um, there's a lot of emotions that are dwelling on our coworkers' lives these days, and it's more crucial now than ever to lead with empathy, to be flexible and expect the best in people and not to expect the worst. Um, and so with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, again, we are going to have the video and the slides up um, on our website within 48 hours. And then you'll also receive a survey as well tomorrow if you would like to give us any feedback. Um, with that, Brittany, did you have any questions? Yeah, we had a couple come through. So this one is regarding the subject line. Um, this individual works in an office and says that sometimes she receives emails that uh, give a short heads up or a message like, Jimmy John's dropped off free sandwiches. Um, she realizes that it isn't the most professional, but is that acceptable for an inter-office email? I mean, I, I think mean, I think you know your audience. Um, if you if your coworkers do that often, you know, if free Jimmy John sandwiches are um, delivered often, I think that's okay as long as it's in her office. Um, especially if that's something that you guys commonly do. So I think that's more of just like a know your audience type of a thing. Um, you might not want to put your your boss or your boss's boss or someone who that doesn't really appeal to on that email chain. So double checking who that's going to or um, maybe making, you know, a group in your contact list, um, the Jimmy John's group or what have you. So that way, you know that it's going to the right people. Um, but that would kind of be my advice on that. But you can use your own discretion. If that's something your office does, then, you know, keep doing it. Who doesn't want free sandwiches? <laughs> and for this particular question, Joseph, we may need a little bit more clarification, um, but he says, I do not see the same at the top of my Outlook email. How can we do this if we do not have the same? Um, you are not the same options on your Outlook email. You can... Um, do you like a YouTube search? I would look to see what version of Outlook you have. Um, we have the most updated version and you might have an older version, but there is a way to do all of those options. So for example, when I was looking at that YouTube video, there were Outlook, you know, 2016 version, Outlook 2013 version, um, all the different versions. So he, the, the guy, if you go to that link, he has a whole list of trainings and he trains you on whatever virgin, version that you have um, available to you. So you can go ahead and watch those that way. And it might not be the exact buttons that I took a screenshot of because we have a pretty updated version of Outlook on our computers with, I, with ISU. Um, so I would just utilize that that way. And you can always try to Google things as well. Google is the best help. Okay, a couple more. How many times should you reply to an email? So let's say you send an email asking a question, they answer, um, and then should you say thank you? And if you do say thank you and they respond to say you're welcome, should you reply to that email as well? I would say no. Um, obviously, use your discretion with this. 
one i think one, 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 you're uh, using those goodbye phrases like we would in person like thank you you're welcome okay we'll talk later things like that those are things that you would say in person so once those start infiltrating the email the email chain i think you're good to know that it is done so just using your your own discretion and your own cues with that um i would say if someone says thank you then the conversation is is ended um but if you are having an email chain where you're responding things that shortly um, it might be better to just have a quick phone call about that directive um, so that way you're not filling up your email with things that are little um, or if it's like an inner office thing it might be easier to just send them a quick text to do a quick directive that you need done and then just say thanks um, I know that our office, we all have each other's personal phone numbers um, and we all text each other quite frequently. And if that's not something your office does, you guys might look into something like, you know, Microsoft Teams where you have a chat function and you can be more casual in those interactions and not be flooding up your email with those, those things. So that would be my advice on that. Are you aware of a tool that helps with reading or responding to emails out loud? Um, like if you're, if you are reading your email out loud and then it's interpreting it, or I guess I'm confused on that. I'm not. So I'm, sorry, I'm going to assume, and Nikki, correct us if we're wrong, but I'm going to assume you're referring to um, accessibility for um, reading and responding to emails. I know that those types of tools do exist. Um, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, possibly Kirsten knows of some, but you know, Google is our best friend, especially right now with everything being virtual. Um, I would imagine if you did a search, you could probably find some, some great accessibility tools when it comes to um, working virtually. Yeah, I'm not aware of any specific software, but I know that if you reach out to people in that realm, then they should be able to provide you with some. Again, always Google is your best friend as well. Um, and this live closed captioning that you're seeing is through Google Slides. Um, so maybe implementing something like that um, into your work life too. Okay, so we have one more question and then we'll wrap up to be um, polite of everyone's time. But what is a polite way to ask someone to not reply to all? Um, I mean, I would say use your discretion, know your audience. For me, I'm more of a direct person and my coworkers know that. So I'm more just like, you know, um, I, I'm not really sure how I would specifically word this, but I would just say, um, this directive is specifically for you, or um, do I need to bring so-and-so in on this, yes or no? No, you do not need to bring so-and-so in on this. Um, you know, it doesn't concern them. I'm more of a direct person, and I think that that works with clear and conciseness, but also can be misconstrued as abrupt. And so um, just knowing your audience and what they're going to best interpret things to. Again, like I said, we're missing that emotional context. And we can get to that point where we have that emotional context with the people that we're emailing. It just takes a lot more trial and error and it takes a lot longer. So if you're emailing people that you do know personally or have a working relationship with and you've had a working relationship with them prior to, um, you know, being stuck at home or working from home full time, then you already have some of that emotional context built up with them and you can use that to your discretion. If you're emailing a stranger, then you might want to be a little bit more um, clear and concise and but also, you know, lead with empathy in your text as well. So just using your discretion, I don't have like a specific um, phrase or something, but it might be worth your time to build a template and your outlook for for things like that. Um, and maybe Google, you know, what is the best, most polite way to ask someone not to reply. And then maybe you build a template and that's something that you incorporate in your emails when you need to use that phrase or what have you. Okay, that's currently all the questions we have. 
Okay, awesome. Well, like I said, thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope that you did find this content content somewhat beneficial. Um, we will have this recording um, live on our YouTube, and we will have the PowerPoint slides, and then I have a reference sheet for some great some great references for email etiquette and the YouTube videos and all that um, that I referenced during this presentation. And we will have those uploaded to our website within 48 hours. Um, and our website is icsps.illinoisstate.edu. Um, and we will have that up within 48 hours. Did you have any final things, Brittany? Nope, just an excellent webinar. And thank you for the wonderful information. So thank you, Kirsten. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Wednesday.